Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta. And joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And writer Squatran Bowie. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello, folks. Let's jump into it. We have a news podcast today. There's a lot of news that broke yesterday. Like, it's been, like, weeks and weeks of a drought of news. And, like, it seemed like everybody decided to, like, announce their new things. And just for – I don't know. I don't know why it was, but there was just a ton of new news yesterday. It made me feel alive, (laughs) which is kind of (laughs) sad. But, uh, Chris, let's start with something that broke today, actually. And that is that Westworld is getting renewed for a fourth season and might be planned for a six-season run? What do we know? Yeah. Yes. Here's something that doesn't make me feel alive. Instead, it makes me groan inside because Westworld is bad now. But people are still watching. It is watching. not bad. No, this it's is, really no, bad. No, no, no. <laughs> so people are still watching it, though. So HBO has already gone ahead and given it a fourth season. And while it's not official yet, um, behind the scenes rumblings indicate that uh, Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan, the, the showrunners, are uh, pretty much attached to make six seasons in total. So not only is are we getting another season, we're getting two more seasons after that, apparently, which I'm sure will make someone happy, but not me. Hey, I'm happy, Chris. This is, this sure is good you are, news Peter. for me. <laughs> but what I'm wondering, Chris, is... Okay, let's yeah. talk. Let's talk briefly about Westworld. And I guess spoilers for the end of season two. It's not really spoiling anything because they're marketing. Like the whole marketing for season three reveals this. So season one took place in the park. Season two explored other worlds within this Delos Park structure. And season three took us outside of the park into this future world itself. It all seems like this season is going down to an end game of you know there's this big evil corporation who owns a simulation of everything in existence and uh you know Dolores and it it almost felt like this season was going to an end point that could end the series so i guess my question to you chris where could this possibly be going because i feel like every season has been kind of like an onion like peeling off another layer uh, or peeling into I guess from the inside out, from the core right. and, out, and 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 like an onion, it stinks and makes you cry. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's the what's the other layers? What are the three other layers we're going to get to? Because I don't, I you know, I'm right there with you. I honestly don't know where the show is going from here because this season has had nothing to do with the parks, which is you know fine, but this season, like at the moment, it's all about like bringing down society i guess as we know it so i maybe like the next two next three seasons are going to be sort of like a planet of the apes thing where it's like robots have taken over the human world that's only thing i could think of because that seems oh. to be where this season is going where dolores is, is bringing down all these you know human things and maybe the next season is going to be you know robots roam the earth i don't i don't I, this is me just spitballing i have no idea all i know is i wish the show would end <laughs> well i'm gonna still watch it chris I, I i think that could be cool if we actually get the arc of the the robots taking over the world and then eventually the human uprising to regain it I back mean, yeah, no yeah i said when i wrote this story up that even though i'm not happy with this season if if they pull off like a, a killer season finale, then I will reluctantly watch the next season. But for now, I'm I'm really not enjoying what's going on with this show. Okay, speaking of not in, not enjoying things, they have, an, <laughs> they have announced another Hunger Games movie. HD, tell yes. me about this. Because we what we all need in the world right now is another Hunger Games movie. Uh, Lionsgate has officially confirmed that they're moving forward with an adaptation of the Hunger Games prequel novel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. And this Hunger Games prequel will tell the origin of the series villain, President Snow, who was played in the film by Donald Sutherland. This is an adaptation of the upcoming book that Susan Collins has um has written it will be published uh sometime in may may 19th and um it's been in the works for about a year now with talks and discussions uh kind of going around but now lionsgate has confirmed they're officially moving forward with it and uh that francis lawrence is returning to direct the film after helming the last uh three 
Hunger Games movies. He directed Catching Fire, Mockingjay Part 1, and Mockingjay Part 2. So he will be returning as well as a few of the uh, of the franchise's old creative team, including Nina Jacobson, who produced all the Hunger Games movies. Is anybody excited about this? Is, like I, I feel like Hunger Games is one of those phenomenons that even the people involved didn't understand why it was so big. Yeah, I... I definitely am not excited. I don't think right now we, the world is, you know, excited about an anti-hero movie about a rich white man's rise to becoming a tyrant. Um, but, um, yeah, I I don't think that, I mean, other than Donald Sutherland, who was fine in the movies, I don't know if there's a big appeal to this character. Um, I read all of the Hunger Games books. I thought, you know, they were okay. They had some good ideas, but sort of the juvenile writing style and then a really, really bad ending kind of soured me on the entire series. And the movies themselves were just kind of fine as well. I, I They were a little too, uh, I guess they came a little too late for me to get onto the on board the YA hype train for it. So it was just, um, it was a phenomenon that, that also escapes me kind of. I, I watched all the, actually, I don't think I watched the last Mockingjay movie because I hated the ending so much of the book. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I can't say I'm excited about this uh, prequel movie. I Will do- they get uh, Kiefer Sutherland to play the young Donald Sutherland? That's my question. Oh, that would actually be fun. <laughs> like, how young is the character? Is he like a teenager? Because that wouldn't work. But if he's I like a teenager, he's a teenager. teenager. He's uh, well, old. actually, they should just get Kiefer Sutherland to play a teenager because that would be amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's move on to another thing that I think we're not all excited about. Let's talk about Venom 2. Ben, tell us about that. Yeah, so there are two little pieces of news here about Venom 2. One is that the release date has changed uh, from October 2nd, 2020, which is when it was originally supposed to come out, is now coming out next summer. So June 25th, 2021 is when Venom 2 will be unleashed upon the world. And uh, the more interesting piece of information is that it now has an official title, which is Venom, colon, Let There Be Carnage. Which uh, uh, Chris Evangelista likes so much that he actually changed his username in our Slack channel to Chris Evangelista. Let there be carnage. By the it's way, a I, good, I, it's a good title. I'm not gonna. We, we need to put an end to this, Chris. I'm, I'm getting notifications on my phone throughout the day. I, ch- I changed the... it back. It's normal okay. now. Your your phone just hasn't updated yet. I changed it. It was a one day thing. Because <laughs> I was like, why do I have to be reminded of this title all day long? <laughs> Yeah, I, I so we don't really know much about the movie. Other, I mean, obviously, Let There Be Carnage is referencing the character of Carnage, which is played by uh, Woody Harrelson. Um, he, I guess, briefly appeared in the first Venom. I, I'll be honest with you guys, I never even watched the first Venom. I still have not seen that movie, even though I know most of the people on this podcast have. And, and even, like, some of its moments, I remember Jacob specifically going to bat for, like, a couple moments from that movie. It, being it, it our, is like, an enjoyable mess. I haven't seen it yet, Ben. Solidarity. Okay. All right, uh, maybe I'll get around to it. But I'd totally forgotten that Andy Serkis is going to be directing the sequel, which, like, I think I wrote the news story about that when it happened, but that's how, you know, little I care about the, these uh, non-MCU Sony Marvel movies right now that I just totally forgot <laughs> that that was a thing that's happening. But that is happening, and, uh, yeah, so that I guess Tom Hardy is coming back to fight Carnage this time and now they have an eighth month, an eight month delay to uh, hopefully make the movie as, as you know as good as it can possibly be. Well, that might be delayed, but Warner Brothers is not going to delay the release of HBO Max. This is their new streaming service. They have announced the official launch date. HD, when are we going to get HBO Max? Yes, we knew for months that HBO Max would be launching sometime in May 2020, but now we have learned the official launch date is May 27th, 2020. Uh, Warner Media has set this launch date and announced a slate of six Max originals. Uh, They're not called HBO Max originals, it's called Max originals. uh, That will be debuting on day one, which include a new Anna Kendrick series, who apparently is kind of the go-to new platform star. She has a series on Quibi. Um... And uh, on Disney Plus, she has a film on Disney Plus, and yeah. then she now has a series on Love Life. So, you know, Peacock series when, um, uh, which is called Love Life, a Sundance documentary on the record, a underground ballroom dance competition, Legendary, a crafting show called Cracktopia, a new Looney Tunes cartoons, and the Sesame Workshops, the Not Too Late show with Elmo. So this will be, yeah, launching May 27th now, and uh, that's coming up soon. I know we're all... 
you know, stuck at home or looking for more content. Is any of this exciting to you, HT? Um, <laughs> you know, the not too late show with Elmo actually looks kind of fun, even though I'm not the target audience for it. It just seems like a real fun spin on the late night variety show um, format with, you know, John Mulaney shows up. So I just kind of want to see it for John Mulaney's episode because he already seems like a Sesame Street character come to life. And um, so, yeah, that one look, looks fun. I like the idea that there are new Looney Tunes cartoons. I might You're not check interested out Love in Love Life? Life? It looks I don't good. Know. It no? looks fine. It just kind of looks like it hits all the beats of like every millennial ro- <laughs> dating show, like romance show. Um, but you know, Anna Kendrick is charming enough, so let me. I'm, I might check it out. Um, but I am more excited about the sort of library of Warner Brothers content that's coming with it, like Warner Brothers, as well as HBO and various affiliates, uh, DC Entertainment, etc. So because um, I know the, the entire Doctor Who series uh, a new series coming on as well as friends and um the studio ghibli uh collection so it's just uh, it's more exciting for me that for the library content than the new stuff but maybe once we learn more about these new originals i'll get um i'll, I'll get i'll be it'll pique my interest yeah it should be noted that we do have the trailers for all those hbo max originals and we'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to go check them out right now. Uh, but let's talk about Warner Brothers, Warner Media. They, I guess, with the coronavirus, they're now starting to rethink the theatrical model. Ben, what does that mean? I don't really know, Peter. So uh, the chief operating officer of AT&T, which owns Warner Media and Warner Brothers, said on an earnings call this morning that the company is, quote, rethinking our theatrical model and looking for ways to accelerate efforts that are consistent with the rapid changes in consumer behavior. Um, that's a, a pretty charged quote, because uh, without the proper context, you could take that to mean that they might be thinking of abandoning the, you know, abandoning the theatrical model entirely. Um, I don't know if they're willing to go that far. In fact, I, I would almost bet a, a large amount of money yeah. that they're not willing to go quite that far. But, uh, you know, we're living in different times now. So Warner Brothers has already implemented changes that just a couple months ago, a few months ago, would have been totally unthinkable for this industry. Like Birds of Prey was made available on digital platforms way sooner than it would have been otherwise. Just yesterday, they announced that Scoob, an animated feature that was uh, designed for a theatrical release, is skipping theaters entirely and going straight to digital. So I think that's probably what he's talking about is just rethinking the options for every movie that they have and really like giving each film a close look and deciding which ones are worth saving for theaters and which ones aren't. Um, we had reported a while back that uh, that there was a, a story going around that Warner Brothers had actually considered um, releasing Wonder Woman 1984 digitally instead of putting it in theaters. Um, it, evidently that did not happen. They, they bumped the release date and that's now scheduled for August. But the fact that they were considering it, I think sort of speaks to what this quote is talking about. They're rethinking the theatrical model. What does that mean? Which movies exactly are they, are they going to be, uh, you know, dropping on digital? Which ones are they going to be holding for theaters? Um, there are a lot of questions here, but that's sort of where we stand right now. Yeah. They're, they're going to release Tenet straight to your small TV, just the way Christopher Nolan wants. But, uh, yeah, I would bet that that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the the most interesting thing here is that quote was not uh, did not come with any kind of like reassurances to the exhibition like community to NATO and all those you know these movie theaters. Like usually when you have a quote like this, there's like oh don't worry, you know this is just like a one time thing or I don't know, it's just a, a very broad quote that is intriguing possibly scary it might show us uh, what the, what the future ha- holds for us but um you know t- talking about the future holding for us th- there is this documentary called spaceship earth and the new trailer has just come out this is from neon and they are distributing this in an innovative way yeah this is really interesting i don't think i've seen enough coverage of this online because uh peter have you ever watched a full movie on a restaurant's website because that is oh every is, every week 
Ben, every week. <laughs> That's what's going to happen here. So Spaceship Earth is this documentary um, about these uh, people who in the early 90s spent two years quarantined inside of this uh, replica of Earth's ecosystem. Um, so you can watch the trailer on the on our website and everything. And the movie itself looks interesting yeah. and fine and, and it's a little bit like um, Wild Wild Country, but more contained kind of. There's like cult stuff going on there. And, um, and by the way, when you say replica of the Earth's ecosystem, we're like talking about like Biodome from like the yes. movie Biodome. Because I feel like yeah, that's exactly. the, the most cultural reference of what this is, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Anytime Pauly Shore is the cultural <laughs> touch point, we're, we're doing well as a, as a society. Uh, but the, the release strategy is the really interesting thing about this. So they are going to be putting this. Neon is the distributor. They're the, the distributors of movies like Parasite and Portrait of a Lady on Fire. They are putting this movie in drive-in theaters, and they're going to have some pop-up cityscape projections safely accessible by quarantined city dwellers. So we've seen stuff like this before. I think uh, A24 did that where they like played movies on billboards across the country in, in certain spots. But the the thing that's new about this is that this they've, Neon has teamed with a bunch of different companies to get this out to the widest audience possible. So they're launching it on theater websites and websites of other businesses that have no uh, attachment to the film world at all. So like museums, bookstores, restaurants, things like that can opt in and, and partner with Neon to make this movie available on their websites, which I've never heard of before. I've never heard of, of you know, you being able to go to the website of your favorite bookstore and watch a, you know, a re- recently released movie um, that way. And you can go to, to this article and, and find out more information uh, you know, if you are a small business owner and you're interested in, in partnering with them, you can sign up to do that uh, at their website. You can figure out how to do that. They're, the movie's also going to have a traditional digital rollout, so it'll be available on Amazon and Fandango Now and Hulu and Vudu and all the other, you know, sort of major places. But I just thought it was really interesting that they're sort of um, rethinking what a digital release looks like in the era of the coronavirus and then also sort of opening things up to places that wouldn't norm- normally have anything to do with movies and sort of helping them participate in this and, and uh, get the word out that way. I feel like this is just publicity. Do you know what I mean? I don't feel like many people are going to be watching this movie on a restaurant website. Well, I don't know how many people are actually going to tune in to do it, but just the fact that it is now an option that that has been done, I feel like it's more interesting for the ground that it's breaking than the actual um, you know numbers that it might generate in this specific case. But if the world continues the way it is, um, I, I can see this kind of strategy becoming more of a normal thing than you know than it ever was before. Future of movie watching, not not in the cinema, but on a museum website, I guess, maybe. Um, we were talking previously about South by Southwest and how they have teamed with Amazon to bring their film festival, which was canceled, onto the internet for all to see. Uh, we, we had like, heard that filmmakers were hesitant about signing on for this ambitious uh, new way of presenting South by HD. What, what is the result? Yeah, so a new report from Inverse suggests that Amazon was having trouble finding filmmakers to participate in the South by Southwest online festival, which, as you said, was in partnership with South by Southwest. But um, despite the uh, premise of the festival seeming like a really generous way of offering the filmmakers the exposure that they would have gotten on South by Southwest, it actually uh, seems like it could hurt the indie films more than they could help them. Um, In the report, at least seven filmmakers declined Amazon's offer, citing the sort of low screening fees and the uh, potential distribution deals that could be um, messed with if 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 the films were shown on Amazon. Essentially, um, these filmmakers who are looking to make distribution or sales deals uh, would not be able to uh, go through with these deals if they the films were debuted on Amazon to the thousands of people who have access to the Amazon um, website because this was being offered for free to everyone who has an Amazon account, not just Amazon Prime members. So um, they're saying that if because Amazon is not committing to distributing these films, they're just showing them on their site. Um, it's actually yeah helping. Uh, it's not hurting. It's hurting them more than helping, essentially. And um, 
the, a day after that report uh, came out, Amazon revealed the South by Southwest lineup, which is pretty slim. Only uh, several films were uh, t- announced on it, and many of which we haven't really heard of. Um, so there are uh, 39 films in all, which are narrative and documentary features. The narrative features are The Cat in the Wall, Gunpowder Heart, Le Choc du Futur, Selfie, and a couple other documentary features like I'm Gonna Make You Love Me, My Darling Vivian, and TFW No GF. So nothing that we had especially heard of in the buzz leading up to South by Southwest. So it seems like a lot of the uh, films that were being anticipated and even some of the more major studio films just declined Amazon's offer. That's kind of disappointing. I'm wondering if, you know, once if we get into the fall festivals and if they're canceled, if we're going to see a change in the strategy here, if we're going to see like an actually like an actual online film festival that is showing some, you know, bigger films and and how that's going to be held. But it seems like this this one is kind of forgettable. So, uh, OK, let's talk lastly about the opening reopening of movie theaters. It looks like. You know, Georgia is going to allow movie theaters to reopen next week. Chris, tell us about it. Uh, Yeah. So Brian Kemp, who is the governor of Georgia and the same person who claimed recently that he didn't know the coronavirus could be spread without symptoms, even though that is public knowledge to literally everyone, uh, announced that he's trying to reopen (laughs) businesses in Georgia this Friday. He's he doesn't. Like, you know, it's a bad idea, but he's going to do it anyway. And among the businesses he said that could reopen are movie theaters, which he said could reopen Monday, because I guess those those extra three days of the weekend will make a big difference. But uh, here's the thing. Most movie theaters in Georgia, even though they can reopen, aren't going to reopen. Um I reached out to uh, AMC and Cinemark and Regal. Uh, Cinem- both Cinemark and Regal got back to me and said they have no plans to reopen. Uh, Variety dug into this and found out that AMC is not planning on reopening. Pretty much no one in Georgia is comfortable reopening, despite what Brian Kemp says. Um, a few independent theaters might try and reopen, but for the most part, uh, people are are still going to wait. The, you know, the earliest I can get I can see for a commitment here is Cinemark, you know, they're still pushing for their July opening date. And at least one independent theater owner in this story said uh, they were going to wait till at least June to reopen and maybe later than that. So, yeah, uh, when this story broke, uh, everyone was reporting Georgia movie theaters will reopen Monday. And that's they kind of jumped the gun there because it really doesn't seem like that's going to happen. So tell me this, is, is there any, like, any restrictions here? Like, is there, like, oh, they can reopen, but they have to have, like, you know, six feet of space between people? Or... No, no, there's nothing. It's literally just, you know, have fun. Go to the movie. I, I, I thought that I read that only ten people could be, uh, like, gathered at once. Like, they're, they're holding true to that uh, restriction, which means that, you know, the, for these theaters to open and, like, pay their employees to to be there and and I was going to say run the projectors, but people don't really do that anymore. But, you know, uh, to run concessions and, and whatever, um, for only 10 people to be allowed in at a time, I think I saw something where it's like, you know, even if theaters wanted to, it doesn't really make much financial sense for them. So maybe I'm... Wait, I'm, uh, is it 10 people in a room or 10 people in the business? Yeah, I don't know. I, I maybe shouldn't have brought this up because I don't have the specifics in front of me, but, but uh, <laughs> that, that is what I read yesterday. So, And, you uh, know, that also ties into it because even if theaters wanted to reopen my Monday, no one is really ready to do this. I mean, all pretty much all theater employees across the, the country are, are furloughed or even laid off. So no one's really ready to come back to work at, you know, the drop of a hat. Uh, and on top of that, there's also, you know, legal issues here. Like, you know, say, say, you know, if movie theaters reopen and a lot of people do just go to the movies in Georgia on Monday. Uh, if they get sick, you know, could they sue the movie theater? And then on top of all of that, there's also the fact that there are no new movies at the moment. There, everything has been delayed. Um, the, the earliest new movie at the moment is The Green Knight, which is still listed as a May release, which is not going to happen. And then beyond that, 
there's you know july which has you know mulan still and tenet but again those those dates could change so you know even if every theater in georgia said yes we are opening on monday they're not going to have anything to show chris what what restrictions and what would have to happen in the worldwide uh, sense of this pandemic to make you comfortable going into a theater again to watch a movie? I mean, I would need there to be like multiple scientific experts, multiple doctors who know what they're talking about, who all get together and agree, yes, you can go back to the movies. Like until that happens, I'm not going to feel that comfort. I mean, yesterday a story broke that revealed that the virus can now be spread by air conditioning and summer is coming. And that's going to, that's going to complicate things even more like, you know, movie theaters, you're sitting in the air conditioned movie theater is the air conditioning spreading the virus even more like uh, until, until there's like a uh, near unanimous agreement that things are okay. Now I, I think I'm always going to feel a little nervous also, you know, I'm different in the sense that when I go to the movies, I try to sit as far away from people to begin with. So I'm, I was, I was a uh, social distancing before this even happened. So I was ahead of the curve. <laughs> okay. That brings us to the end of today's slash film daily. You can find more of all of our work at slash film.com. You can find this podcast published on iTunes, Google overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at Peter at slash film.com and rate and read this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word. And we will see you on Friday.